Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, what is up? What is good? The king, the king of lightning is here today bringing you guys and gals Kingdom chapter 508, 509, and 510 review. Three chapters, one video. This video was done early on in the week. However, I didn't like the video, and I said, okay, let me do it again. And again, it wound up being later on in the week. So it is what it is, and I do apologize. But we have a lot of things to cover, so really no time to chit-chat, because we're going to go from Baggio all the way to Osin just straight dipping. The dude is in the wind. It's like, what? Uh, dude, Retsubi, the mechanisms of Retsubi are a trap. It's a trap that Riboku has set up. And you're like, what the? Whoa. Like, hmm. like Osin could see the meticulous thought out plan that Shoei Kun and company had devised rumbling before him because of Retsubi. So so let's go step by step, chapter by chapter. First of all, chapter 508. In this chapter, there are about two to three general parts. First and foremost, when it comes to this pacing, we have number one, Baggio and the Mountain Tribes. They establish a foothold and they're able to actually go all the way down to the city floor. The tribe is called, I think, the Chica tribe. They're kind of like dogs, and they sniff out the location of the lever for the gate, which allows Shin and company to enter. That's number one. Number two is the Haishin unit they enter. So sweet. He leads the initial pack, and then you have the rookies. They go in there, and it's their first time battling Kanto and company. And basically, things don't go well for them at all. One of their friends gets his head caught off, and then their squad commander gets killed as well. And then they get saved by infantry commander Suigen. And then after some dialogue between Suigen and Kanto and other rookies, you have, I would say, the third part of the chapter, where you have this special cavalry of Zhao come in, the Raika cavalry. And they actually are able to take down Denyu. So Denyu gets wounded, and... Like, is it just me, or does Denyu... He has his good moments, but I think he has more bad moments than good moments. Like, I swear, I swear to God, Denyu gets, like, shafted a lot. Like, a lot. I'm not going crazy, right? There's always something going on when Denyu is almost, like, dead. It's like, dude, like, at some point, Shin is going to start losing commanders. That's obvious to me. Denyu is going to be one of them, and I hate that because I love Denyu. But Denyu, like, there's always something going on, whether it be allies or whether it be enemies, Denyu gets shafted. And like, like, remember in the previous arc when they were going to kill Denyu because Kyokai was doing some reckless shit? It's like, why, why does Denyu always get shafted? Whatever. So, yeah, Denyu, he gets beaten by this Rika Kavri leader dude, and then out comes shit with the glaive. Oh, it's massive, man. He just raised this shit like... Yeah. And then he cuts this guy down. It's heavy. So that's the chapter structure. You have, again, those three parts. So from a pacing standpoint, it's all right. Because even though it's three separate parts, it's still a part of the general chain of the battle flow. So once again, from a pacing slash structure standpoint, fine. Nothing too crazy or any issues there. Makes perfect sense. It is what it is. Moving on to the characterization. Number one, we have Baggio. Now, we all know that Baggio is a fierce, very fierce warrior. Right? One of the best mountain warriors we've seen to date by leaps and bounds. And Baggio, as usual, impressive flips, corkscrew blade cuts, and one on one not. But there was one moment where it was like, what the? And that was clearly when the Zhao soldiers, they buckle down and they have their shields up. Their plan is to surround Baggio and crush him because he is one man after all. However, what Baggio does is kind of like, like, as far as this eyebrow can go, like, you... what? Huh? It was when Baggio does, like, a dynamic, a might guy, dynamic entry kick against, like, the front guy who's wielding a shield. So it's like a row of dudes holding a shield, you know, and they're behind each other. The kick is so powerful that, like, the first three dudes get, like, their heads crushed in. The metal of the shield gets dented in deep. And then four or five dudes gets it flying. And then that whole, like, 
column row, that whole array, that whole grid of shield dudes gets blasted with one kick, with one dynamic entry. And I'm sitting here like, he's not hulking. Like, what? What? Like, that shocked me, honestly. Like, it wasn't a glaive attack. It wasn't, like, some crazy sword maneuver. It was a kick. It was a fucking kick. Again, we know Bajo's powerful. And it's been some time since we've seen him fight. But we can up his combat prowess level now, for sure. Because that kick was in that one kick was insane. Number two for characterization is going to be Tanto and I'm gonna group them all together like the rookie guys because basically it's their first battle and you see how they handle their first battle. And it doesn't go too well for most of the rookies at all. They need help from Suigen. And so we can shift over to him for characterization. Number three, Suigen. The Suigen, he appears to be like the leader of like the rookies. Like he's mentoring them. Like he's not a rookie himself, obviously, but he's mentoring them and he's saving them because he sees promise in a lot of these guys like Kanto and company. So he comes in there, he saves them. He's like, listen, like no excuses. I'll leave someone here to watch over you guys. He is the sensei of the rookies. So that's Suigen. And that's cool to see. I like that. The last number three for characterization. And then number four, finally, Chin, Wave. The fact that he can just swing it with such force and devastation, and he takes out the, I would assume, the head of the Riker Calvary in like one go quite easily. So from that standpoint of characterization, it's little because it does up his combat prowess because he is using Oki's glaive, but then it's clarified in the next chapter as to what's really going on there. But if we take it in of itself, that is some characterization for Shin in that regard. He didn't master the glaive, but he can use the glaive to an extent to where he can take out someone of his caliber. So that is it from a characterization standpoint. And finally, from a story progression standpoint, essentially them infiltrating Red Subi. So the whole thing in a broad general nutshell is mountain tribes, they establish a foothold, open the gate, action unit, they go in like they planned from the beginning. And it's playing out the way they planned it. That being said, when it comes from a characterization standpoint, not really much there for most of the characters with the exception of maybe Suigen, but again, that's not really huge either, because we did see previously that he was kind of mentoring over the rookies, but he's even doing it now in the midst of combat to make sure that they're still alive for the sake of the high school in the future. So you do have characterization, yes, but in most respects, it's not really strong. And then you, when it comes to story progression, the fact that they have broken through the gates of Ritsubi is, I would say for the arc, a pretty monumental step because we're talking about establishing a foothold in the midst of Zao territory and they've already opened the gates to this major city. So even though it's the simplest portion of the chapter, I would say that the story progression is the biggest component of the chapter and the rest are fairly okay. So the chapter rating I'm gonna say is an okay plus chapter of Kingdom. So even though it had some pretty epic moments, overall it is a simple straightforward chapter. Next we go on to chapter 509 where there is a lot more, oh a lot more going on there. Now when it comes to chapter 509, let's start here as usual the pacing slash structure of the chapter. We have about five major parts to this chapter, five. So the last one is three, this one's five. Number one, Shin and the Glaive. Shin, ooh, he's just looking impressive at first. And you're like, whoa, Shin, captain of the Haishin unit, god damn. And he's looking fierce, to be honest, man. But then it kind of shifts to, he's not master of the blade yet. Like he, he's not rocking the Oki lips <laughs> just yet. He's not going, no, 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 he's not there yet. But basically, Shin, He's getting tagged. He's taking too long to swing the blade. And then on top of that, some of the mountain tribe guys, they come in there. So Shin and Hashin Yuna, I forgot what his name was. I think his name is Gao or Garo. Um, the guy who was formerly a member of Dukio's army. Like one of the Dukio guys. Basically, he's like, listen, Shin, we have to hurry up because if we don't hurry up. The mountain tribe, they're going to take all the glory. So Shin and company, they haul ass. And this leads to part two of the chapter structure and the pacing where... Ohon and company, they reach there, Retsubi's already fallen, and then you have Shin on top of one of the major buildings in the center with high Shin unit flag, and he's, you know, thumbs up, like, yeah, <laughs> we, we did it. Then you have part three, where you have Ohon, you have Kaki, you have Moten, you have Osin and company. They enter Retsubi, 
And then Olsen and company, they, they pass by Ten, Ensign, and other Hyshin unit guys. And you have Olsen, he's like analyzing the area. And then you have one of the random dudes of Olsen's like elite dudes talk to Ten and say, we'll take care of the rest. Meaning that they're going to be fortifying Retsubi. And on top of that, let's not forget here that the main purpose of this whole campaign is to attack the city of Gyo. That is the main purpose here. Then we go on to part four of the pacing of the structure where word reaches Kosan Ryu and his army is only like half a day's march from Retsubi, but Retsubi is already taken down and you have the men of his army, like his lieutenants, they're saying, we can go in there, we can retake it. But he's like, no, no, retreat because they've fallen for a trap by none other than Riboku, of, of course, okay? Riboku not sitting on his ass, just twiddling his thumbs, waiting the shit just, you know, pass on by, no, no, no. Riboku already has shit in motion. No surprise, but it's pretty shocking in of itself because what is happening is actually Ritsubi. There is some kind of plot that is embedded within the mechanisms of Ritsubi itself. And then the only person to notice this is Oshin. And then that is the end of the chapter part five. So again, you have five parts here to this chapter. Some are large, some are small but all relatively important when it comes to, again, entering Ritsubi. And so that right there is the chapter structure and the pacing. Again, you have those five parts. Most are small, but most are also major as well. So for this, I'm going to say the pacing and the chapter structure was pretty damn good. I'm going to say good plus the great. Now we move on to characterization. Number one, Shin, Aishin unit. Now in the previous chapter, we see Shin take out one of the Riker Calvary leaders. Just, you know, glaive. Yeah. Looking very impressive. Next chapter, this chapter, chapter 509. Shin starts off in the same impressive fashion. Cut these dudes down. You see these dudes flying, the glaive just looking huge, crushing dudes, like holy shit. But then, Kyokai starts pointing out, hold on, look very carefully. You think he's master the glaive? No, 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 not so fast. Look, and you see Shin, he's taking extra long to swing. And as he's doing so, he's getting tagged by other soldiers. And he's able to kill them, but he's taking too long to swing. And as a result, he's getting wounds. And he, of course, blames the glaive for being heavy because it is a heavy glaive. All right, this is Oki's glaive. This is not a bitch tier glaive. All right, this is a glaive where you need lips. You you need lips in order to utilize the glaive. And Shin ain't rocking those lips yet. For characterization, there are a few things that we need to recall here. Number one, this is, again, Oki's glaive, a very heavy glaive. A glaive where when it was brought to him, this big dude, bigger than Shin, was like, shit, God damn, this is heavy. Could barely hold it up. And he presents it to Shin, and then Shin can feel the weight, and so on and so forth. But number two, remember this, Shin is not proficient at using glaives at all. Like, he's getting there, but he still has a long way to go. The one dude from the Wayfire Dragons that fought against Shin, I forgot his name was, he noted how Shin was not proficient at using glaives, but what made him deadly was his ability to persevere and to go headfirst into the face of danger. And that's what made him deadly. So that's why him and Shin could go toe to toe, even though the guy was a far more proficient blade user. Uh, Gaimo, that's his name, there we go. Gaimo of the Wayfire Dragon. So we have to remember those two things, not just the fact that the glaive is heavy, but also the fact that Shin himself is not a proficient glaive user. He is mainly trained and utilized the sword. So when it comes to characterization, not only is it important to remember that he has a ways to go when it comes from a muscle standpoint, because he has to build that necessary muscle in order to utilize the glaive properly, but also from a skill standpoint, he has not reached that skill level where you can say he is proficient at using glaive. So those two things are important when it comes to that first part of the characterization. When he does attain this necessary skill and strength, you may see his lips get bigger. All right, it's mandatory. Your lips have to get bigger once you attain a certain level of glaive skill. <laughs> it is what it is. Number two for characterization, it's Osin. Only two folks in this chapter get real characterization, Shin and Osin. You can say Riboku because Riboku, he did have some type of play already embedded in Retsubi itself. So that just amplifies his intelligence. But the fact that Osin was able to recognize that and not only recognize that, but then come to understand that the plan that Shohei Kun and company had thought over for, I think, over a year, that plan was slowly crumbling before his very eyes because of what he had come to understand about Retsubi itself. 
which is pretty insane. So we're getting more characterization on the intellectual prowess of someone like Osen. And also I will say this, it reminded me of the scene between uh, Shin and Ryofu a while back. Shin confronts Ryofu. Like he jumps down from like the top of something. I believe it was around the time before Sei's brother died, I forget. Shin drops down from Ryofu. He confronts Ryofu, like you won't win and so on and so forth. You don't have what it takes to rule the nation, like that kind of stuff. And when Ryofu was like walking away, Shin noted how to him, Ryofu was still a really large dude. If you've noticed, and I'm pretty sure you have, since you've read 500 plus chapters of Kingdom, size in Kingdom is not just physical, it's also like there's a metaphorical, fictional kind of component to it as well. Where like these guys seem larger than life because of X, Y, and Z reasons. Either it's because of their skill, their influence. So here you have someone like Osin, who is a strategist of high caliber, very high caliber. And then you have Ten next to him when he's passing on by. And he looks huge. And looking at it from a strategist standpoint, it would kind of indicate that 10 has a long way to go as a strategist to where the, I suppose, metaphorical, the fictional size of Osin is diminished. He's still bigger than her, obviously. And so that is it from a characterization standpoint. I don't want to really throw in 10 there because I am reaching from that size standpoint. I believe I am. Because even though it's been a thing that we've seen through and through again, to say that's the case when he walks by, because he is commanding this massive force against Zhao. So from that standpoint of influence, he's huge. But I think also it's because of the strategist thing as well. But that is my assumption on the matter at hand. So from that standpoint of characterization, I'm gonna say it was good, like okay plus to good. So moving on from there, we have the story progression. Number one for story clearly is going to be the capture of Retsubi, Shin and company, they do their job, they clear Retsubi, and then you see Shin number two, part for story, when you have Oho and company, they arrive there, they see Shin on top of the thing. So part one and part two are kind of the same thing, part two much smaller, because Oho and he is now finally back with the main army. And I did call that, at least I believe I called it, where I said, if Ohon does arrive there, if we take Yotano out of her word, by the time Ohon reaches the main army, the battle is probably going to be over. And lo and behold, the battle's already over. Shin's there, you know, like half ah, flag. Yeah, we did it. I did call that. I believe so. I believe so. You can check me on that. But nonetheless, Retsubi has fallen. They enter Retsubi, but something is immediately off to guys like Osa. To actually, no, the only person that noticed was Osin. Osin notes that something is off here. And then we deviate over to Kosan Ryu, who explains to his lieutenants and whatnot that they're gonna be retreating because within Retsubi is a trap. Retsubi itself is a trap. It's a trap, and a trap created by none other than Riboku himself. Osin sees that, and that's where it is. When it comes to that section of the chapter, even though it's simple, major things, very major things. That being said, folks, when it comes to the chapter rating for this chapter, I'm gonna say it's a great chapter of Kingdom, and then we'll move on to finally chapter 510, the latest chapter of Kingdom. Now, this chapter from the previous chapters is far simpler, far simpler, but there are a few things here for characterization that I think are noteworthy. So when it comes from a pacing slash structure standpoint, once again, you have, I believe, three parts. Yeah, three parts. Number one, the first part. Shosa, you have Bihe, you have Suigen, they're talking to the rookies. They're talking to new cats like Kanto, the apparent Tone brothers, right? They're new about various things, like their first battles, like where they should go from here. Let's drink because the fact that you're still alive is enough to just drink. I mean, it's a war type of thing, so I'm not surprised at all. That's really it for that part. Number two, Ten and Jin. This is at the very least the second to largest part of the structure. And on the way to see Osin and herself, she runs into Jin. And then that's when Ten and Jin talk about various things. Finally, part three, small part, by comparison when it comes to the structure of the chapter. And she goes to the headquarters where Osin should be, where Osin should be, but Osin has dipped. Yotan was there, ends there, many people are there, but not Osin, at Osin's headquarters. So that is the pacing slash chapter structure. Again, very simple, very straightforward, three parts overall, okay, nothing too negative, nothing too positive, just relatively simple, straightforward pacing. The next part of this chapter review, of course, the characterization. Now for characterization, let's start at the beginning here. But my thing here is that 
I'm having trouble saying if it's characterization or if it's something that is more along the lines of reaffirmation. It's stuff that we've seen before, but we're just seeing it again. And it's been a while since we've seen it because among the Aishin unit, these guys don't get that much spotlight anyway, except for BA. But that being said, Bihei, Suigen, Shoha. Shoha and Bihei are now thrown into, I guess, the same mentor role as Suigen to now where they're talking to the young guys about various things, about their achievements or lack thereof, how they should drink afterwards because it is, in a sense, a relief that they're still alive, they're still kicking. You never know when they could be shot in the head by an arrow, the next battle, stuff like that. But then also, it is them talking about Shin. So they talk about their first battles, you know, mainly Suigen. Then afterwards, they talk about Shin and how Shin and his first battle was something truly stupendous. Like, this kid is amazing. When Shin is on the battlefield, it's not like he's their junior. He is truly someone to, I guess, revere. Like, someone to really look up to. Someone that you could really follow. Where in this case, age doesn't matter. That's out the window. Because greatness simply has to be recognized. That's what it boils down to. But see, understand how it's not really new for Bihei, because we got in the previous arc. But it is kind of new, but not really, because we've seen it before through, I think, various ways. Like, it hasn't really been, like, discussed, but we've seen how Shosa and Suigen, how they respect Shin, and how they, I mean, the fuck, they follow Shin, they're under Shin's wing. I believe it's the first time, not Bihei, but it's the first time Suigen and Shoha have talked about Shin like that to other people. But what I will also know for characterization is number two, Kanto. Kanto, I think he's like the most promising dude among all of the new cats, with the exception of Jin. Kanto, he has to struggle. And his first battle was a shit battle. But of course, he recognizes that. His friends died. His five squad commander died. Actually, now I remember that. Bihei, he's still a 10 squad commander. Ah, Bihei, man. Moving on from there, we have... Jin. We see how he reacted to his brother Tan when Tan failed to land any shots. The major achievements of the day go to Jin for the Haishin unit. However, Jin has to still cope with the fact that he's taken so many lives and the fact that his brother couldn't take a single life. So not only does he have to look at this from the outlook of being an earnest soldier and taking people's lives and he has to cope with that, but also he has to lead by example because he is the older brother to the younger brother who couldn't land a single shot. Sometimes it's the reverse, where it's the younger brother leading by example. But in this case, because Tan couldn't land a shot, and we see him in like one of the tents, he's huddled in the corner, he's not celebrating, because essentially he did fail to be a soldier. And it's actually mentioned at the end of the discussion between Suigen and Shosa, where they are worried about both brothers. When it comes to their role in the Haishin unit, what does that mean? And honestly, because Tan, he is someone that is precious to Jin, this can be seen as a death flag because Jin is not going to leave Tan, but Tan may leave Jin. However, if Jin does leave Tan, it would be through Jin's death because Jin was successful. By dying, this would then motivate Tan to become like this lead archer dude among the Haishin unit. It could go either or. I'm not too sure, honestly. But for character, it's mainly on Jin's side. Jin is now coping with his own character development. So it is what it is there. That's really it from a characterization standpoint for this chapter. Finally, we have the story progression where the battle's over, most folks are chilling. Tan knows something about the city. We don't know if she notices what Osin noticed, but she notes that something is a little bit strange with the city. But, Osin, I would say Osin and like his top lieutenants. They're gone. And the headquarters is like now on lockdown. Now, what's going on there exactly? My guess is that they are going deep into Red Subi. They're going fucking deep. They're going fucking deep, man. These next few chapters should be dedicated to what is going on in Red Subi. Where the fuck is Osin? Jin and Tan, and then Zara reacting to one of the prominent border cities being captured. So overall, this chapter, I'm gonna say, is an okay chapter of Kingdom. And that simply boils down to the simplicity of the story progression, even though it's big, the simplicity of the chapter structure, which is very, very simple. And the characterization, where that is also relatively simple, straightforward, but at the same time, there are some little complicated nuggets in there as well. I'm gonna say okay plus. King Lightning, of course, don't be shy. If you've made it all the way through, good job. You like Kingdom, you like fucking me, okay? And that means that you should also rate 
the video. Rate the video. Oh, this is called a mouse is a mouser. Je mouser. You use a mouser to rate the video. Please do not be shy. Comment and use a mouser to subscribe as always. Peace. Have a nice goddamn day.